All right, everyone. Welcome to the D. Hilton webinar, Executive Pay for Performance Trends and Techniques. We're going to go ahead and get rolling pretty shortly here, but I want to get a couple of administrative things out of the way on the front end. Uh, yes, we are actually going to be recording this. So in uh, about three to five days, we'll go ahead and send out an email to everyone who registered. Uh, that'll give them access to a recording of this as well. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or concerns through the process, please go ahead and utilize the Q&A section, or you can actually use the chat section. We have the chat just kind of coming straight to us here as the panelist group here. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions. We're going to try to keep this about uh, 45 minutes or so, 45, 50 minutes, giving you about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to answer any questions that you have. So go ahead as we're going through the process, get those in. We'll get them uh, situated and ready and so we can answer your questions at the end of it. So joining me today, well, actually I introduced myself. My name's Jeff Rock. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, D. Hilton, we're gonna be trying to do uh, one of these webinars pretty much every month. Uh, so expect more to come around on the future here. But joining me today, I have John Andrews with me. Hi, John. Good afternoon. I also have Garrett Chris with me. Hey, Garrett. Hello, everyone. And Jordan Westra, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, hi, everyone. Fantastic. Uh, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to John to kind of lead us through the executive pay for performance trends and techniques. Thanks, Jeff. So one of the things I think we start with is this idea that if you, if you took a poll around the country, what the number one weakness of a volunteer board is, it would be how to set a goal, how to go from A to B. And but what's what's interesting is if you ask CEOs what their number one weakness is, it would be the same thing, how to set a goal. And we go all the way down to department managers, branch managers, and guess what the toughest thing to do is, how to set a goal. So not that a lot of people get formal training in this, it makes all the sense in the world when you look at the textbook, but then when you get to the real world, going from A to B is one of the toughest things to do. So today's presentation, we're gonna simply show you some of the things that we're seeing out there that credit unions are doing or striving um, to, to, to look at, to make sure they're measuring the right things. I think that's one of the biggest fears volunteers have is, am I paying too much, paying not enough? What did I pay for? Um, you know, did, do I understand the idea of metrics and how, how, they, um, how, how they work in, in our environment? So when you look at this quote, we start with the idea that everybody thinks it's an over-the-counter medicine and really it should be prescribed in very specific points with very specific mo monitoring. And I think when you, when you go to this next slide, we know most credit unions of any size are using some type of bonus or incentive plan. And just for semantics, the definition of a bonus is something that happens after the fact. Did we have a good year? Yes or no? Okay, here's some money. And in the old days, what would happen is, let's say we gave a CEO $10,000 and then the board would say, ah, it's, time. it's bonus time again. We had a pretty good year. Was it as good as last year? I don't know. What did, what did we give them last year? I'm not sure what we gave them. So they give $9,000. And all of a sudden the CEO says what? Why? Yeah, did I do $1,000 worse or what was it arbitrary? So the idea of variable pay or pay for performance came in into the landscape simply so we could say at the beginning of a period, if we do this, what would be the formula or the rationale for paying some, some type of incentive? So the board felt good about it, the CEO and the, the management team felt good about it, but this can trickle down all the way to, to the staff. So when you look at this slide, we know that at the billion dollar club, it's, you know, uh, more than nine out of 10 have it. When you go to the hundred to $250 million club, it's a, it's, it's a majority. So, you know, we know people are using these. Now, this is the disconnect. We're using them, but the return or the perceived goodwill for doing this drops more than half. So when you ask all of those boards, what are we doing? Yes, we're doing one. Are you happy with what we're doing? Not so much. So again, today we're gonna to walk through some ideas of what we'd be able to, to use to make, you, make these numbers get closer together. Yes, we're using it. Yes, it's, a, it's an effective tool. So the first thing we talk about is where's the focus going to be? So there's always this balance between having too many and too little metrics when it comes to what's gonna be our strategic plan or strategic direction. So if you're at 30,000 foot, 
you start to get that warm and fuzzy language that are on business help, self-help books, you know, like, you know, the four pillars of this and the three things of excellence. So at 30,000 foot, we want to be a world-class operation. Um, raise your hand if you don't want to be a world-class operation. It's like mom, apple pie, Chevrolet, you know, it just goes in primary financial institution of every member, but you can't, that we can't articulate that to our frontline employee of, you know, in, in terms of, you know, if they have option A or option B, which one are they supposed to do? Because what's supposed to make me world class? And if you get too far down, things like it's the knee jerk or reaction. So, you know, if we're not doing good in this, well, we need to really focus on this and get this number up. And then again, we miss the macro part of the business. So we're really good at these little things, but they're not adding up into moving the business to where we want from our, our forecast perspective. So that 25,000 foot view is that idea is that we can, we can know what we want. We can make it quantitative to the degree we can make it quantitative and everybody can kind of state where we're going is, is our ultimate goal here. Yeah. I would, I would kind of piggybacking off that a little bit. I would say it's almost the approach of the pie in the sky versus in the weeds too much. And so pie in the sky, 30,000 foot, you know, we're wide range of focus ground level, you know, we're in the weeds. It's focusing on decisions, you know, hey, changing the carpet to this color or what are we going to have for lunch at our next board meeting, certain things of that nature. So it's kind of separating those two, keeping those on the, as the outliers and kind of finding that great middle ground there. So the, the next thing we talk about, so if there's a fear that the system can be gamed or the system that we put into place or the plan we put into place can be manipulated. So let's make, put all the goals into place. So if you go back 25 years when David Hilton and I were first putting these together, so we were trying to mirror almost like a, a, an NCUA audit. Any ratio they looked at, we wanted to measure that as well. And we were getting to, into 90 and to 100 metrics. And obviously that's, that's too many. And that's too much for that frontline employee also to say, what should I, what's my priority or what's, you know, dealt, dealing with two things, which, which do I deal with first? As simple as that. How do I know how to succeed if there's so many different goals? You're yeah, trying there's to always going to be something I want to catch you on, right? Mm -hmm. you, aha, but you didn't do number 87 through 91, <laughs> but you were awesome for, the, for these. So again, too many goals just makes you not look focused in the marketplace with the member or, you know, and it manifests itself also in, in the financial situation as well. So the other one is the idea of using the wrong metrics. So think about this. The easiest, quanti most quantifiable way to do any type of variable pay plan is historical. What have we done for the last five years? What's our average of the last five years? What did we do last year? And let's try to do better than that. But as you know, you know the crystal balls are not as, as strong or as, as uh, uh, crystal clear as we'd like them to be. So sometimes that can be very misleading. So. If I've always done 5% a year and I want to do 5% next year, well, well we've done that. So the, why we like relative metrics, why we like this idea of comparing you to the marketplace is it kind of looks at the, 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 everybody's faced with the same economic conditions in a local community or in a region. So let's think about this. If we've always grown 5% for the last five years, this year we're thinking we're, we're pretty, pretty strong. Let's go for six. Everybody says six. And then at the end of the year, you grew 7%. And everybody's high-fiving each other and we think we're awesome. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes with data. Well, the market grew 9%. So you did your best you've ever done, hands down. But what happened? Relative to the market, you did not actually succeed. You lost market share. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's tough metrics to get a hold of but it's so valuable. How do we do? And the people can de debate peer groups forever. Like they're not like us. We're special. They don't have the branch configuration. They don't have the geography, but sometimes just looking at what banks, community banks are doing in the marketplace, what we're doing in the marketplace helps put in perspective because think of it works on the negative side. Think of the market shrinks. So we have an economic downturn. You've always grown 5% and you tell the board, if you're, if you're on the executive team, oh, it was a tough year out there. Everybody out, out in the marketplace was, was having a tough time and we just leave it there. It, it's not fulfilling. But if you were to say, you know, the market was tough. The market shrunk 5%. We only shrunk 3%. You know, that's a high five. I mean, we, we, we weathered the storm better than other folks out there. So again, we stress that it's great to look year over year because it's historical. It's the easiest thing to do. But then again, it might not be the right perspective of, 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 of where you want to go. You, a product, you put a new product in the marketplace. 
you know, the first dollar you earn is a bazillion percent, right? <laughs> you're doing very well. <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing because last year you had none. So the idea of when we have new markets relative to what's been the historical penetration in the marketplace, all those types of data points can help you figure out what our definition of success is going to be. So when you're looking at these metrics, how often do you feel like it's, it's good for the board to reevaluate them? How much consistency from a year to year do you like to see? Well, the, 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 holy, the holy grail is, you know, we'd love to have three and five year horizons, right? Because we put strategic plans in and then that kind of turns into that 30,000 foot view. We want to be world class by this. We want to have these types of operations by this date. But every year the market changes. I mean, there's just, you know, we go day by day to, to have to deal with certain situations. So we think annual plans are the best and that they should be aligned with your strategic plan, your business forecast. Um, I, I'm sure there's people in our audience today that when you put a three and five year plan together and you think you're going to be at this asset size in year three, mm -hmm. you do a merger and in year one, you're there, the board's going to say, well, that shouldn't count because you got there faster than we thought. And we didn't think about mergers. Or if you're in year three and you purposely have reconfigured your business, so you've slowed down growth and then, you know, I'm never going to get to that five-year plan. So what do you do in those two years? Right. It, it loses motivation. So we think the year concept works real well with pay for performance. Use your retirement and retention plans for the longer term. And you can make those performance based too, by based on milestones. But, you know, it's very tough to have that crystal ball work in that three to five right. year period. So our fourth concern is making sure we don't have the right, uh, make sure we have the correct time, the time horizon, so to speak. One of our classic case studies we do in strategic plan is we talk about what Lee Iacocca said, he says, by 1970, they're going to have an under 2,000 pound car and it's going to cost $2,000 and we're going after Toyota. And everybody's high five and that sounds great. We're all ready for it. But guess what they invented from that? <laughs> that no, no one in this room is old enough to know. I'm going to go with Pinto. Well, did you Google that? No. <laughs> I know a little bit about everything. That's okay, my story. Okay, and I'm sticking okay, to it. Okay. <laughs> so the idea, they, 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 uh, they, they uh, created a car that kind of blew up when it got hit in the back. So the idea is they got to be careful about putting arbitrary things as 30,000 foot goals because the time frame may, may not work with the marketplace, may not work with, with your skills and resources. So this is a classic study. So what I like to tell in, in the 1970s, if I would have said GM or Toyota, let's go to the sixties, GM or Toyota, who'd won that battle? GM. Biggest, baddest company in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what world event happened in the seventies that changed how we looked at cars? The gas shortage, the gas shortage, you know, all of a sudden I remember my dad Sunday night being in line, you know, for two blocks, had to get the gas so he could get to work. And all of a sudden, because of the, the, the oil embargo, people had to look at fuel economy much more than the muscle cars that we had. So, you know, we came from the era of Ford that said you can have any color as long as it's black, black. Right? <laughs> and then we go to this idea of, 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 of what, what, what's going to be important to the consumer of the seventies. And so I remember Toyota got in trouble because they were in California. They were taking pictures of ladies at supermarkets, putting their groceries. It looked like they were stalkers. And it basically what they were trying to do is say, well, what does a housewife need? They need a lower deck in the back to put the groceries and they've got the kid in on their hip. And so that's where they started coming up with this idea of, of minivan. And again, just, just listening to what the consumer wants. So if we had a five-year plan to build this car, but we missed the mark from day one, guess what? Mm -hmm. We're not listening to our member. We weren't, in this case, they weren't listening to the consumer. So we always think that shorter, that time frame, I think is, is, is better. And then having that organization that can react and can take advantage of, of a situation, almost like in, the analogy to me in basketball is a fast break. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have a great design play, but if we've got an easy line to the basket, let's take it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and take advantage of that. It's about the agility of understanding the market is changing, the consumers are changing, and being able to pivot on that moment. Absolutely. Agility is, is in the buzzword vernacular now, and it makes a lot of sense. And now our challenges in pay for performance plans is to recognize innovation, recognize agility, so we can take advantage of that. 
and this reminds me of a good story, John. I remember maybe it was one or two years ago, we were, we were up visiting a client and you and I were talking with the CFO and we were kind of walking through these programs and kind of what, what we were thinking, how we were doing it. And he was, uh, he was talking to us and very candidly, he said, you know, well, look at our growth goals. You know, we have all these things in line. We want to be all, all things to all people. We want to hit the ground running. We want to do all these things. He's like, but what happens? And he's like, there's a love triangle. And I've, so I've kind of stole that, you know, kind of line, that nomenclature. You have a love triangle between, you know, your earnings, your capital, and then also your growth. If you, if you move one, the other one moves and it affects the other. So it's always kind of have, the, have that balancing approach. And it kind of reminds me of this. Well, if we want to grow, you know, X, Y, Z percent over this next year or these next three years, well, what else kind of trickles down after that? And so it's always trying to keep those things in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, when we talk about balanced scorecards, that's the holy grail is when you do one action, it's going to create, you know, consequences in other areas. And the hardest thing in today's environment is to do that juggling. So they all go forward in a, in a positive manner. Taking my Newton's law here, every, every action has an opposite reaction. So we have to balance everything out. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the the stories that we like to tell is is the Wells Fargo story where they had a goal that they wanted eight products per household, and that was the sales goal at the branch level. And okay, you know we hear all about data analytics and all you know the big data that's all the big banks have, and it really came down to eight rhymed with great. So we had a great brand, we had a great slogan, and people said, how the heck are we going to go from two to eight? I don't know, but it rhymes, so let's go after this. And then they were so positive that this was the way to go. They, uh, you know, they said, let's do it again for 10. So when goals are too challenging up front, employees can see through that and they can say, you know, do they shut down all the way? Hopefully not. But if it's not attainable, it's not, not a good goal. So... That's a little bit of some of the things that we think and challenges. If we go to this next story, we go to what are we seeing out there? Because that's probably the number one question we get asked is what are credit union clients using for metrics? So here's the list. Number one and two, when you say board sat and strategic plan execution, let's call it, guess what? They're the most qualitative on this list. You know, did you, are you happy, not happy? So you have to have something because this is a thing that we get feedback from, from CEOs and saying, you know, I, I do great financially, but, you know, I struggle to give some type of structure to how I can get feedback or how the, the board can give me feedback or I can give feedback to my, to, to my employees. But in the credit union space, it's probably the most important. And we'll say it a couple of times today. It's not what gets done, it's how it gets done. And the board should have control or the CEO should have control of the how because you know strategically what you've done with your culture for your members, where you want to go from A to B. And so we can give you all the financial metrics you want and you can have this beautiful balance sheet and it can be absolutely off the mark of where you want to go for your members. And sometimes as, as weird as it sounds, sometimes we make difficult business decisions on purpose because we're not for profit or because we know it's good for our community, <laughs> our members. Whereas if we were a for-profit entity, we wouldn't even question we'd close the legacy branch. We wouldn't put an ATM there. We wouldn't offer a special product bundle for, you know, first time home buyers or people, uh, you know, headed off to college. So when you look at those net met next metrics up there on the financials, those are common. There's, there's nothing that's going to be, you know, oh my gosh, I don't, I can't believe we're not using those, but it's the context of how you use them and how you use them in, in concert with other ones. Um, what's interesting after 08 and 09, we saw people wanting to shrink and not necessarily have member growth as, as a key priority. And guess what? In the last two years, you know, the plans that we're doing, we're seeing that make a kind of a raging, raging entrance back onto, onto the playing field here because they definitely want to see now it's time to, to rev those engines and see what we can do with the business. Yeah. Same thing. When you looked at, you know, a few years back, it was, you know, where are we at loan wise? What can we do? How can we measure this appropriately? You know, and now it's the flip side. Hey, we have way too many loans. How are we going to get these deposits to go back up and how can we kind of offset that and balance this out? And so now we've kind of seen that trickle of effect of getting where loan loans were way at the top. Now deposit growth and measuring that type of success has kind of moved its way up. 
But one thing, you know, to keep in mind, as always is, you know, this isn't a, a, you know, these 15 have to be on your plan, or if you don't have these on your plan, you know, you have a horrible plan, nor when you look at the percentages, either, you know, that type of a deal, it's more so, hey, this is like kind of that holistic, broad look of, where are we at? What are what are other people are using? Because you can't really take this as 100% gospel in terms of, okay, I've had the highest percentages on there because like John and everybody has, has said, leading into this is you always got to take it as a case by case basis because what your, your organization is different. You want to make sure you're moving the needle in the way that you need to move it. So when we look at kind of the trends right now, what we're moving towards, easily nine out of 10 of our clients are using earnings. So you think of pay for performance, what is the holy grail? How do I afford to pay this? What did I gain to get this? So the, the, the goal is to get a definition of what value was created so you can share in that value, pay for performance. Um, a, a new twist that, that's kind of come from the for-profit world is earnings and sometimes to be a circuit breaker. So until we have a certain level of earnings, then, we're, then all the other metrics can be awarded or recognized. So it just it just uh, it just gives you nice linkage between if if we get to this level of uh, of of performance, then we're willing to share. Um, I think we're getting away from some of the macro questions and really focusing more on where where things are coming from. Um, you know, to have all your eggs in a merger basket. The only way we're going to grow is merger. You know, it's going to be kind of like what the the Yankees that put two people on and then you know, hit a home run, they're always going for the three run deal where some people are going to be stealing second and then hitting a single and bunting. You need to know what works for your organization. Is it going to be incremental gains or is it going to be swinging for the fences? Can you do all of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. But when you look at, you know, some of the challenges with indirect lending over the years, people thought that was a great um, member generation device. Not only were we getting a car loan, but we're going to get these members. And I think a lot of folks would agree with me that you bought a loan, but you didn't necessarily buy a relationship. And sometimes you can spend a ton of money to make that relationship work. And, you know, you just see people when the loan's over, you know, the relationship's over. So asking the questions of how you make money, how you are successful, and not just using the generic, you know, umbrella words, I think give everybody better alignment with what you're going to pay for and what you're going to define success as. Um, one of the questions we've seen, obviously we've had a lot of turnover at the CEO level in the last four or five years, just, just because of the attrition of or the, the tenure of, of our, our CEO folks out there. We're seeing a lot of employee satisfaction engagement type of surveys come back into the scorecards for first time CEOs, it, it, especially after mat, mergers where we're seeing the cultures change. Um, it's a good, good way to just measure that a key you know, a, a, cre- a, a key um, constituent that makes us successful is being managed properly. And then finally, strategic plan execution. I think, you know, Jordan, you said earlier about being in the weeds on some things. Um, you know, the board invests a lot in planning and a lot of credit unions really believe they're strategic plan centric organizations. We've got to get an alignment on, on that with, with pay for performance goals. And that makes all that investment worthwhile. Um, what I like to say is the heavy lifting for variable pay design happens at the strategic planning session, not when we approve a budget. Because that's where we're going to hear where the board wants to go, where the senior management thinks they can take us. That's where we start to document the A to B. So you're talking about these uh, you know, higher turnover with CEOs. How can credit unions start to prepare themselves of uh, transitioning to that new CEO while still staying with the scorecard? Do they change their metrics? How do they approach that situation? I think there has to be f- more frequent points of contact. You know, if you've had a CEO for 20, 20 years and you've had a great relationship, you know, they, if I just look this way, they know what they need to do, you know, and, and we don't need to do strategic planning really because we've got a good plan. We trust them, um, you know, implicitly it's going to be great. But as you develop, develop a relationship with the new CEO and the on, onboarding process, the more frequent contact we can have in those first two years of how we're going to set goals. Because a lot of times, it, what, I get, you know, the cliche, there's a lot of low hanging fruit, a new CEO, come, oh, we'll change this and that and that. And all of a sudden it looks wonderful, mm-hmm. but then the hard work starts. So the more that they can work together of saying, this is your chance to do something different. You know, if, if, if you know, it just wasn't a time to maybe 
broach the subject, you might want to go a different direction or you might want to emphasize something else with a new CEO, a new management team, you do have that opportunity. So you should take it, take advantage of it. And that whole process should definitely start much, you know, a couple of one or two years out before that transition happens. So they're prepared. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, our recruiters will tell you that t the time to hire for our chief executives is getting longer because there's a sh smaller pool of folks. It takes longer time to go find the folks that are going to be good, good matches. So the best sales job a board can have when they're interviewing new folks is here's what we want to do. Are you in, you know, it's going to be a sales job, so to speak. So the more they can use these types of tools, and then commit to those. We're going to do pay for performance for you. Because I think a lot of the newer CEOs, not age related, but just the newer CEOs, type A personalities, you know, give me a goal. I want to run through it. You know, how high is the wall? I'll, I'll, I'll blow through it. So you got to be prepared to have that discussion where you might not have had that with your longer term CEO. Okay. So some of the, the ideas now, again, as Jordan said earlier, we're not trying to say you got to have everything on your plan because that starts to look like, you know, just, just a hot mess, so to speak. <laughs> Here's so, your procedure manual. Go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and also if, if I, if you, if you put a plan together with eight metrics and I came back in five years and saw the exact same eight metrics, you know what I would say? We haven't, we haven't done the work. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen how our membership has changed or evolved, how the community that we serve or serves has changed. So that has to be evolving. But again, these are some of the things that we see. There's no really value judgment or is one better than the other, but these are the, the bigger categories. So when you see project execution down there, you know, again, something that's emerging is as we go more digital platforms, as we go more towards new software and, 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 and having multiple apps and we're the kind of the gateway for, where members can use us for a number of things, how fast and how efficient and how, how time efficient and how, you know, budget efficient we are in rolling those things that are going to be important. So this concept of milestones is very important again, because unfortunately not all variable pay plans have a neat and tidy 12 month period. You know, on January 1st, we're all ready to go. And in 12, 1231, we're having the party because just there's got to be multi-year goals in the situation to, to, to make it realistic. So what's our milestones for that? So I've said it before, but this is kind of my mantra. It's not what you pay, it's what you pay for. And so when we can link the pay, don't think of it as the money because the, they, will, they will cash the checks, but it's the idea of it's the recognition that goes with it, okay? So we're pretty strong proponents of balanced scorecards. So the idea of if you think of a quadrant, if, if we had one dimensional goals, save, exp you know, reduce expenses. CEOs would just, you just, your mouth would water, right? What would you do? Somebody leaves, don't hire them. There's a hole in the roof, get a bucket. You know, simple, <laughs> simple as that. Because when you let that, get, you know, you take care of the expenses, but it's at the expense of what? And it's going to be member service. You know, the phones don't get answered. People don't have the knowledge they have to hand off to you know, more experienced employees. And all of a sudden we've lost the member experience that we're striving for. So think of the quadrants. So think of the audiences that we need to be accountable to as a volunteer board or to a senior management team as we put variable pay in place. Uh, good, Ta start at the top right. How do we look to our owner, member owner, because we're not for profit, we're the credit union industry. So we want to show safety and soundness. So why do you have a uh, capital ratio? Why do you have earnings? Because you're saying, we are going to be here and be good stewards of the money. Simple as that. But if that's overemphasized, then all of a sudden you don't take the right risk. You don't get into innovation. And the member experience is, isn't differentiated from out there in the mm -hmm. marketplace. And sometimes when you focus on a strength of yours, you're actually starting to introduce a weakness because you focus too much on a that. Absolutely. You know, a tennis player that's got the great mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right hand and the left one just kind of with us because you're not, <laughs> you're not balanced, right? So that second quadrant, how do we look to our customer? Now in the Craigian space, we all know that it takes $5 or $25 to be a member, but we're talking about the person that uses you or the household in a, in a multi-product uh, situation. They're helping the cooperative more than somebody that just puts $25 in there for their grandkid and then leaves it you know, for 10 years and it costs us $200 a year to take care of their $25. We're not making that up in volume. So we do use this concept of customer because we're trying to look at our membership and say, 
who's embracing what we do, who's the best folks we can support, and then get some feedback on how we're doing, because they're going to drive the business. And then this third quadrant on strategic execution, and that's just to look how we're getting a return on the investment. So, you know, is it growth? Is it, you know, new, is it new digital experience? It can be a lot of different things, but we're just saying how we're doing, how we're ex executing some of those tactical things for the year. And then finally, in that upper right quadrant, which I think is the strongest one here, which is governance. How are we working with the volunteers to, to execute a strategy, to deliver a result that's part of the board's vision? You know, all of this pales in comparison if we're not, we're not, we're missing the mark on that, on that quadrant. That's very tough for a management team to deliver. If you think about it, perfect, you know, execution and, and, and all of those areas. So if, you know, we want a nice balanced scorecard, tell us why you wouldn't necessarily want to just do the same weight for all your metrics. What, what's kind of a trap with doing that? Well, one of the things like, let's, let's say you have, eight metrics and they're all weighted the same. What you're saying is they're equally important. Mm -hmm. And when you look at a strategic plan, there's one, two or three kind of vision statements that come out. We're going to be the best at this, or we're going to strive to do that. And so when you, when you look at the, the um, weights of, you know, assign a prioritized list of what you want to accomplish, I think it really is a nice gift for the management team to say, you know, given option A and B, I pick A because it's going to help you know, better aligned with the priorities out there. Okay. Um, I always, you know, an analogy, if, if you've ever had a performance evaluation for a staff level and one of the criteria is neat and tidy desk, follow the dress code <laughs> and show up on time and make loans. If they're all weighted the same, I can be the best dress showing up on time guy out there mm -hmm. and have no clue how to make a loan. And I don't, I don't move the business, do I? but I check all the boxes. So you got to be careful sometimes when you put those metrics together, they're easy to, to validate yes, no, right or wrong, but they don't move the business. Yeah. And we think uh, changing the weights on a year to year is a little easier for boards than actually changing the metrics. We can focus yeah. on yeah. different metrics year to year. It's yeah. a little bit of a smoother transition. Well, a, a, a real life example that right now is as credit unions have tried to ramp up more of the asset growth and some of the deposit growth where, you know, it might have always been on the scorecard, but a lower weight. Now maybe it's it's equal or greater weight than the lending growth, and that will help you um, kind of emphasize what you need to do with, with with the strategy for the year. Now this kind of next part of the presentation, simply talking about the soft stuff, and sometimes the reluctance to pay for those type of metrics when we know. You know, if we have earnings, that makes sense. But if we have better member experience scores or net promoter scores, how, how does that connect? And in our environment, it's that balanced scorecard if we have to work in all those areas. So when you ask CEOs and in other industries, this is one of their biggest complaints, this quote here. Eight out of 10 simply say that you just can't come... You can't capture the momentum of our business, the effect of, of our businesses, even our weaknesses based on past performance that year over year. Why? Because they might be going after different things. Strategically, they might be redirecting their business. Um, you know, how would you like to be a typewriter manufacturer doing strategic planning today? You know, do you want to make red ones or green ones? Like, uh, I don't care. <laughs> but, but in history, we've always done good at that. Well, what are we going to do? You know, keyboard, you know, how are we going to work? You know, in the digital age is going to be much more important. So again, listening to what the CEO says in the strategic planning environment is very, very productive to having something at the back end that works is tell us what innovation's coming. To, what do you see three years from now? And rewarding recognizing that. Let's, let's go and make those investments today instead of always playing catch up, which is sometimes how, how some organizations feel. So I'm going to spend a little time on this. If you want more information in this area, you know, call us. But if you look at success, everybody can look at results. That's the easy one. But the, if you really drill down, it comes to, to relationships and processes. And a, and a huge amount of stuff when we look at organizational reviews is we're looking at process and relationship driving the business. So if we can get that into our pay for performance metrics, I think that can be a strong thing to make, make the overall plan 
um, um, more aligned with what we're to, trying to do strategically. So remember, it's okay to talk about process, not in the weed process, but the idea is that, um, you know, take a mortgage pipeline, anything that we can do to cut down the amount of time it gets for that person to apply or that member to apply to where we fulfill that request every day, we shave off the process, huge returns. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to talk about relative, hey, out there in the marketplace, it takes them four days. Why is it taking us six days? Boom. That can definitely something I would, would, would make compensatory because I, cause that makes me money. And then the relationship piece, you know, how we work with employees, how we work with members, how we work with regulators, how we work with vendors, all, you know, you look at the good cultures, they are really good at that. Mm -hmm. And so again, how do we measure that or recognize that, that that's important to us? What they classify as a differentiators. You know, yeah, we how, differentiate. Yeah. 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 So when we, again, a little bit more on the process, think of results as the routine and many leaders have less experience in evaluating these two. And again, strategic planning is a great time to carve out some time to talk about that and, and how we want to maybe incorporate that into maybe the board evaluation process or how we do strategic planning and execution. So on process, the three things that we're looking for when we try to improve a process, is it clear and logical? Is it efficient? You know, it could get, we can get from A to B, but we, if it takes too long to get there, it might not be efficient. And then finally, um, is it appropriate? Is it overkill? Is it underkill to provide the fulfillment to, to the members what we're looking for? And again, when we look at first time CEOs, there is a lot of low hanging fruit sometimes. It's, you know, we've always done it this way. We've never thought about that. That's how they told us in the manual to do it. A new CEO comes on board and we change some of those things. But if you get that into your mindset, I think it's very, very important. So this, the story I like to tell about process is, if you go back to the 1970s, credit union employees, as I understood it, were not allowed to make loans, which is kind of weird, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have loan officers. Only volunteers on credit committees can make loans. We'd get all the paperwork ready, but they would meet once a week. So how efficient, effective, responsive were we in the 70s if the committee met on Wednesday night and you applied on Thursday, you waited a whole week for your answer. And back then you said, okay, I'll wait. But then we started to do marketing and say, we got to do this in a day. And staff would go, that's no way here. Take, you know, on Monday we do this on Tuesday, we do that. There's no way. But if we don't, we, we shrivel. So we found a way. And then we came back and said, if, um, you know, everybody else does it a day, we're going to do it in a half a day. So the marketing material would say, apply in the morning, get your answer at night. And then we went to staff and people fell over and had put brown paper bags <laughs> on their heads. Like, it's okay. There's no way we can do this. And we did that. So a day became four hours, four hours became 60 minutes and 60 minutes became the classic 30 minutes or less. And you know who we have to thank for 30 minutes, right? Domino's. Domino's pizza. <laughs> so I was in college back then and we'd be at the furniture house and we would give the worst directions and we'd go, cause back then, 30 minutes or over meant free pizza. Yeah, free pizza. Free pizza. Exactly. That's awesome. So we'd go, okay, you go down Main Street, go on Elm, Turk, two left. You see that red house? You don't want the red house. You want the one in the green? We'll be in the back. We go 27, 28, 29. <laughs> yes, free pizza. So, <laughs> and then, so we had, that became film processing. That became oil changes. Every, the definition of convenient and fast in America became 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then it became five minutes. And really today it's, you don't even know you need a new car. I'm going to give you one you know, pre-approval. It's already here and waiting for it. It's here because you, we know you needed one. So this process idea, especially in the retail financial service business is so important because the member's expectation is changing. The bar's higher. We get compared to a lot of different businesses other than the bank down the street. And we have to be better at that. And then when we get the relationship here. Um, we're looking at measuring those relationships that impact the business. So intuitively, you know, member, you know, happy, I mean, employee, happy employee would mean happy service, probably happy member is going to tell their friends and family that we're good. Uh, happy vendor is going to maybe put us on the front of the uh, top of the list if there's a programming issue. So all of these things need to be measured and, and monitored because what it's telling the management team is we value these pieces. And if we value these pieces of these relationships, it will help our business. Will it manifest itself in a stronger ROA? Probably. Will it manifest itself in growth? Probably. But again, we can't forget about 
you know, the micro piece of this of how we get from A to B and what are the kind of the, the magic bullets for us? Cause they're not going to be the same for every credit union out there. So one of the things I think we also try to emphasize with boards is to make sure we're committed to innovation. You know, we have to cut down timeframes and we have to cut down um, uh, 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 processes. So with that said, remember innovation means we're going to make mistakes and mistakes. Some, some, or some type A personalities never want to admit they make a mistake. They never want to get close to that line where it could be, they could be accused of making a mistake. And what we're saying is, look, you're going to have nine out of 10 things that are going to stink up the joint sometimes. And you're just going to have those situations where you're going to need to try. I mean, this is an art. This is a social science. I mean, Jeff, what, you know, what do you want for lunch? I, you've always had uh, chicken fingers for like, <laughs> since I've known you and then you come in and want a steak, I, you know. I'm going to throw you off completely here. But, you know, innovation, I got to figure out, well, is he moving towards steak? Is he the chicken finger guy? <laughs> so far as a chicken finger guy. So, you know the way to my heart. That's it. Simple as that. That's true. So kind of our last slide here. One of the number one weaknesses of the Fortune 500 world when it comes to strategic planning is they don't ever close the loop. If it doesn't work, they keep moving on and they forget to say, well, why didn't it work? So I'm trying to get across this, this concept of, you know, if you're 100 out of 100 on your strategic plan, that's great. Now, we're not trying to give you a, a, a lower score, but how much innovation, trial and error is in that plan? Because that will make you better. But you got to take it in the right perspective, right? That it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to try some things that might not work because there's going to be a home run. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at board evaluations, one of the things we always look at is innovation. Is that CEO, is that senior management team getting you ready for the future, you know? buying that piece of property that that's where the town's moving. So that's going to be a great in three years um, investing in, in, in digital projects products, because today they're not working, but uh, are, you know, they're just not, you know, fully scalable, but they're going to be. So there's nothing wrong with that. So again, when you get to strategic planning, always spend some time saying, you know, what worked, what didn't work, what, what would we do that again? And what we'd move move towards and perhaps okay. why it didn't work on the other side yeah, of things because yeah. the agile nature of things if you're experimenting and trying new things yeah like you said some of them are just not going to work when it comes down to it okay all right um <laughs> we're listening apparently <laughs> so I uh, will go ahead and open it up. If you have any questions, go ahead and submit some information now. We'd be happy to reach out um, or answer them while we have them now. This is, by the way, uh, D. Hilton is a doggy culture, and we have a lot of dogs in the office today. So that's why we say, say we look at uh, that for we're all ears to listen if there's anything out there that we want to talk about. So for a, a credit union who's interested in switching to the scorecard, balance scorecard, what's, some, what's the type of approach that you typically have for clients to make that transition? What does that look like? The transition from what to what? From their current uh, incentive ah. situation to uh, using what we use, the balance scorecard approach. Well, what's interesting about that is, you know, we're dealing with people's paychecks and we're dealing with their livelihood and we're dealing with, um, you know, the recognition piece of this. So if you're making a drastic change, like you've never done variable pay or you've done it one way and now you're changing, we always recommend a pilot year. Mm -hmm. And I think, a pilot year is just a longer ramp, a little longer ramp up time to get it successful, but makes a lot of sense to get everybody having peace of mind that it's going to work. So if there's any doubt from a volunteer's perspective that, you know, we're going to overpay or we're going to not measure the right things, make it a pilot, you know, keep doing what you're doing and then run it parallel paths and then see if we would have done this, how it, you know, just to, just to demonstrate and prove um, that, uh, you know, it's still going to, meet the objectives. So the idea is um, you can do that with one metric. You can do it for the whole plan. Like if you've always measured something historically and you want to do something from a relative perspective with peers, run it, run it, run it parallel. You know, it's not for in the money that first year, but you're going to, you know, simulate it. And then if, then we go green light in year two. Yeah. By just simply kind of running it, like John was saying, as a parallel study to it, you kind of have that, you know, side by side, look at everything. So you can see if it's, if it's a full program, you can kind of see, okay, 
hey, we have X, Y, Z that are similar. These ones are different. However, by measuring these things on this different, on this different platform, different area, we can kind of see, okay, well, that qualified for this type of amount of payout versus this type of amount of payout. Are we okay with that? Is it in line? Did we shock the system too much? And hey, okay, well, let's re reassess. It kind of gives you that opportunity to, um, you know, do that innovation, like John was saying, where it's not necessarily a mistake or you're going to run into those I types of deals. It's just more so that, you know, hey, it's a justification on making this change as a whole. Yeah, we had one question come up. Can you show us a sample balance scorecard? So what we're going to, what we'll do is in the PowerPoint presentation, we'll make a few um, um, uh, marks or notations. Say, hey, go to slide and off the top of head. I don't know which, which it is, but we'll show you the balance port scorecard concept. And then we'll kind of show you what types of metrics that go into that. You can't use it verbatim, unfortunately, because, you know, we don't know your shop. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know if, if, you know, if you've got a, if you need to do capital accumulation and we're telling you to grow your assets, guess what? We don't want that to come back and, and haunt you. So um, look at the spirit of the quadrant, look at what you're doing now, kind of put them in those four areas. And if you don't have anything in one of the areas, you know, come back and talk to us and maybe we can help you with some ideas there. Yeah, that's okay. a great point. It needs to be balanced towards your strategic initiative and towards the needs of your members and your organization. Yeah. Uh, so just the blanket one won't we'll cut it. Yeah, but we, you know, th that's a good starting point. So we'll, we'll help you out the best we can on that. Yeah, one of the disconnects that we that we sometimes run into, because with the with kind of using the balance scorecard, it, it kind of has that idea or that idea off the top of the head that says, you know, balance, okay, so there's going to be an even number of metrics, even number of weighting for everything. But the idea isn't that it's even and even it's more so that all of the stakeholders that we have involved are taken into account. And that's kind of the main message that we always want to want to get across. Okay. Another question we had um, in terms of the CEO's pay, uh, John, you mind talking about why we use asset size to, you know, set their peer group, yeah. um, use it in our database and why that's the route we go for um, our market pricing. You know, one of the, the, the most frequent question, question answer, asked of D Hilton is what do we pay our CEO? What do we pay our senior management teams when we're doing recruiting? And, so for 20 years, we've done a study every two years, we look at the correlation between certain metrics and how they impact pay. So intuitively, you think the bigger the shop, meaning assets, the bigger the paycheck should be. And, and it, there's a correlation, but it's like 50, you know, 0.5. It's not 1.0. You know, if it's 1.0 correlations, if it's dark outside, you can't see 1.0. So half is about the best we see. Um, Earnings don't correlate with, with CEO pay. Yeah, we see assets and members. Members and, and sometimes employees. Those mm -hmm. are the top three. And those are the best things we have. The number one influencer pay is strategic, I mean, uh, board compensation philosophy. And, um, you know, what they want to do with their business is really the, the, the key driver. But assets are really uh, members and employees are kind of our top three that we, we kind of default to. Okay. And uh, another question, do we provide a review of existing balanced scorecard plans or do consulting services? Oh, absolutely. Them? Yeah. You know, one of the things I think we pride ourselves in is we don't want to change things to change things. We are very okay as a company to say, we like what you're doing and it gives you affirmation. Um, if there's things wrong, we're going to be honest with you. If there's things that we think that you could revise to make it better, we're going to be honest with you, but we're not starting with a blank sheet of paper. And so, yeah, we're happy, happy to look at that um, again, but we want to see everybody do the work and the work, meaning you're, you're doing your strategic planning. You've got a good game plan for where you want to go. And, um, and, and then it, then it kind of falls into place pretty well. And another thing to consider when you're looking at asset range is that you're picking a peer group. Uh, so if you're trying to go in between that peer group, probably not the best representation. If you're looking to alter that peer group, yeah, we can do a different asset size, uh, kind of going back to what we were talking about just a moment ago, rather yeah. than saying, okay, well, we're ranging 500 to a billion. Uh, they should be in the middle of that area. If they're looking for a tighter peer group, then yeah, we can do a different peer group. Uh, but for the most part, 
we kind of keep it in. This is your peers and this yeah. is what your peers are paying. There, there's a, there's a question. There was a question that if the board is really locked into a specific salary survey or locked into a specific asset band, what can you do to um, um, provide suggestions or alternatives? So, you know, I get to go to eight or nine board meetings a month and I get to hear the same types of questions from volunteers. <laughs> and the number one is like who we compare ourselves to. So if you go to a salary survey, they're typical cuts, data cuts. So the classics are, you know, 250 to 500 million, 500 million to a billion and then over a billion. So we've always taken the position, well, if you're nine, if Friday you're 999 million and then on Monday you're 1 billion, doesn't mean you should get a 20% raise. So what we do is we keep data by credit union. So we have data points and not salary surveys so we can be real custom on your peer group. So if you were 890 million, you might be at the top of the 500 to a billion dollar group, which you know, means that you might have a short runway. But if we said we can give you 750 to 1.2 billion, guess what? You're right in the middle and that will grow with you as you grow. So one of the things we talk about in that situation is making sure you can explain to your volunteers where you can get the best information that, that, that's going to meet your situation. So just like in basketball, when you're a tweener, you know, you're not a, you're not a guard, you're not a forward. Well, if you're 890 million, we could be a tweener if your only surveys are 500 to a billion and a billion to two. And then when you get to the billion dollar club, most of the 315 or so credit unions skew between 1 billion and 2 billion. So if you're 3 billion and you, and you have a, just a survey that looks at over a billion, you could be diluting the worth of the job simply because of the, 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 you know, the one cut of data. So I think we do a really nice job of giving the boards a lot more flexibility on how to, how to pick who you compare against. Okay. Another question we had uh, come in. When using asset size, how do you factor in mortgage servicing portfolios and yeah. or investments from wealth advisors? Yeah. So when we look at, we want to look at your scope of business. And so when we put together a pay philosophy, one of the things we talk about is we want to explain to the world the scope and sophistication of your business. If you sell a lot of mortgages, that's part of the yearly business. So that should be included. If you have a huge wealth management practice and you know, you're a $500 million credit union, but you have $200 million of assets under management, you are really a $700 million outfit. So as long as you can work with your board and they can understand and appreciate the scope of the operation, you can, you can definitely look at those things. Now with this caveat, guess what? You're not the only organization out there that has wealth management and mortgage operations. So it, it does seem to skew as there are some really good outliers that do a real excellent job in some of these lines of business, but a lot of people are pretty good at all the lines of business. So you have to be real careful that you don't overvalue your scope versus what your peer scope might be, but you can do that. You got to do that by, you know, credit union by credit. Union. You just can't go to salary survey and hope that that picks it out for you, unfortunately. Okay, great. Um, you have two other questions, just some administrative stuff. Jeff, do you want to Talk about where they can get this and what's what's in the future. You got it. So in the future, we're going to be, uh, like I said, we're going to be hoping to do one of these every month. Uh, the next couple ones we're going to be looking at is, uh, I believe we're going to do SERP, Supplemental Executive Retirement Plans. Retirement Retention, our, our uh, latest surveys come out. So we've got some hot off the press data mm -hmm. and also the idea of how pay for performance is actually going into that design arena of, of making sure that we're locking in the good talent for a nice long time. Fantastic. And we're also going to be looking at employee experience and satisfaction as well. So we'll be bringing in there quite a few different topics. That being said, uh, after this presentation, we're, uh, when we send out the recording, we're also going to be sending out a survey. On that survey, there's going to be a little box that says, you know, hey, I would like you guys to talk about this subject. If you have something that you want us to talk about, have a subject that's burning the hole in your pocket, so to speak, uh, go ahead and put it on that survey. Let us know. We'll start uh, putting the pieces together. And if it's something that uh, we should really talk about, we can certainly create something that's specifically for that. And then um, just want to jump in real quick. Uh, we'll see everybody at the CUNA GIC. We're there. I think it's uh, February 23rd to 25th. We've, I think it'll be our 34th out of 35th year being there. So uh, we'll have a lot of our crew here. So 
if, if you do want to continue the discussions, give us an email and then we can set up some time to talk. My record at the GAC as I've eaten 11 times in one day. So <laughs> Not all turkey like uh, no, Thanksgiving. No, 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 no. This is 11 times. So I want to break the record this year. So, so help me out, guys. <laughs> well, well, hopefully we'll go along with that. It's a good record to break. Um, as far as the visuals on the, uh, the slide deck, we'll go ahead and send those out when we send the link. Uh, actually, it might be a little bit after we send the link for that uh, because I, I believe the system is going to automate uh, the recording. But uh, if you do want the slide deck, uh, probably the best bet is go ahead, email one of us, let us know, and we can uh, send that to you as well. Okay, we'll give just a couple more moments for any other questions. Let you grind on that for just a moment. Let's, right. let's, yeah, let's send these people home. I think it's good. Give you a couple more minutes back to your day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We really do sincerely appreciate it. We look forward to you joining in a couple more. Uh, be on the lookout for an email when we're sending out in about three to five days. You'll have a recording of this presentation and uh, look for the next webinars and we'll see you then. Thank you so much. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.